Yang dia sinta Tak perlu saya perlu sari Dia suruh asah We know in that To approach I feel sorry We know you are adding value Yang ni inta We do that Kita buat mari dah Muhim Dia punya sebab dia tak sampai mari dah Jadi Atalah dah terus Kita nak tukar Dari dalam Tapi kita boleh lihat In you You are already competitive You just don't know it yet You may need You have to do your homework The current machine gun Or the sniper You may tell her that you have to start as early as possible. Um, and because we have a lot of funding available to fund research, 
um, we attract really, really high quality minds that are at the forefront of their fields. So um, we really do have a high, high quality education to offer. Um, are there any other reasons why people out there want to study in the U.S.? Go ahead. Okay, yeah, you can major in more than one thing. Um, our education system is very flexible. So let's say you majored in engineering here at the University of Khartoum, and now you're interested in studying economics for your master's degree. That's something you can definitely do. Um, and sometimes pairing those different disciplines really gives you a competitive advantage when you're applying to get jobs in the future. Any other reasons why you might want to study in the US? So you want to, to start a computer science company in the future? And somehow studying in the US will help you with that. Perhaps maybe there are some really um, innovative inventors in the US who might have access to who maybe you could work with. Any other reasons? Back there? Because there are so many universities in the U.S. and so many different graduate programs in the specialization all of you are probably interested in, um, there's a lot of competition. So every single department, like let's say there are a bunch of engineering master's degrees out there, they're competing against one, each other, against one another and they're trying to differentiate themselves, which means they focus really, really closely in on certain specializations so that they can attract people um, and be different and compete against one another. And that also, that competition makes them, makes the whole system very, very strong um, because they're all forcing one another to get better and better and better. Otherwise, they might lose out to a, to a program that's more, that's stronger. Um, so I think we covered all the reasons why you might want to study in the United States. Um, and now I'd like to mention just a major difference between perhaps the Sudanese system that you are used to and the American education system. Um, here in Sudan, as I understand it, you all go through the national exams and then depending upon your score, um, you're sort of given a selection of universities that perhaps you might be accepted into based on how, how well you did on those national exams. And the Ministry of Education is is closely involved in that process of ranking the quality of students and then helping them determine where they're going. In the U.S., universities offer completely independently from the U.S. government. So the U.S. government has absolutely no influence on who a university accepts into their graduate programs or their undergraduate programs, and they also have no influence in who universities offer funding. Um, so that means that all of you have to go directly to the U.S. universities and apply for admission and apply for funding for financial aid. Um, so that's a major difference that a lot of people are unaware of and so it makes the whole process kind of confusing. Um, whereas in the U.K. and other um, international education systems or other countries' education systems, there generally is sort of a test you take, and that test determines who gets in and who doesn't. The U.S.'s system of choosing students for acceptance and for funding is um, a little bit more complex because they're not just going to look at your test scores. Um, and this, this poses a great opportunity for you all because you're not going to be judged just on three hours of your life when you took an exam. The universities are going to want to consider everything that you have accomplished in your life. And they are going to want to get to know you personally before they consider, before they decide whether to let you in or not. And that's why I really like the previous gentleman's presentation. Because he was encouraging you all to tell stories. And you really, for the U.S. education system, need to be able to tell compelling stories about yourself about your motivations for choosing the career path that you've chosen and about maybe the, your future goals and how you feel like your graduate program is going to help you accomplish those goals. So let's move on to discuss the actual parts of the application process. Um, and I hope it's clear, you're, when you apply to a U.S. university, 
you apply it directly, right? So um, every single university has their own application form, which is on the internet, with, like, on their website. You click apply now, and it'll take you to an online application form. Um, and there are a number of requirements that you have to fulfill. So has anybody here heard of, of what's required, what you have to send to a U.S. university to apply? No? Well, let's think about the Sudanese system, because there are some similarities. So what do you have to do to apply to a Sudanese university? Go ahead. You need your certificate, right, from high school. Or if you're applying to a master's program, perhaps you need your bachelor's certificate, right? So the same story for the U.S. education system. You need to have your, you need to send your transcripts, which is the Tafasila, the uh, Tafasila Shihada, um, all of the grades listed out, so that they can see, you know, how well you did. So they don't just want your certificate that says you graduated from the University of Khartoum's Bachelor's of, of Architecture. They want to see, like, see your actual grades. Why do they care about the actual grades in your classes? Because they're going to be looking so closely at your performance um, and paying so closely, so so much close attention to all of every part of who you are, they're going to look at the classes and say, "Oh, this person did really, really well in math, um, and we have a really math-heavy program, so we want this person to come to our program." Or perhaps there is a program that wants people that are really, really good in um, management because their program is sort of geared towards architects who also can manage projects. Um, so that's the kind of really close attention each university is paying to your application. Um, so we've got, the, we've got the transcript, so what's the next thing? Go ahead. Statement of purpose. Statement of purpose. Have any of you heard of the statement of purpose before? It's like the Prisada Shaksiya or the Beyond Shaksi. Have you heard of this before? It's very unique to the U.S. education system, and it's exactly the place where you tell your story. Um, there's a specific place in every single application. Sometimes there are two or three places where you tell different stories about yourself, um, and it's very personal. And it's your opportunity to for the to introduce yourself to the committee who's considering your admission to their university, and it's your opportunity to convince them that you are the student that they want at your university. You are a very unique Sudanese person who has a very unique perspective that you can add to their campus, to their department, that nobody else can offer. And I absolutely agree with the gentleman downstairs' point that Sudanese people are competitive because there are only 187 Sudanese students both undergraduate and graduate studying in the U.S. right now. And that means that there are probably 3,600 universities that have never had a Sudanese student study at their university, or certainly don't have one studying there this year. And I'm not saying that just because you're Sudanese you're going to get in because you're unique, but I am saying that you absolutely have a unique perspective to add to your department. Because Nobody else is from Sudan, and nobody else has had the similar experiences that you have. So the, the personal statement really is where you tell, tell those stories about your motivations, and you reveal that you are somebody unique with something sort of um, something new to add to the department. Okay, what else is what else do you have to send? You need your TOEFL scores and your GRE scores, right? Um, so for most graduate programs, they're going to ask for those two tests. The TOEFL or the IELTS are tests for English, and the GRE is the test of your math and reading comprehension and writing skills. Um, many business programs accept the GRE now. So the GRE and the TOEFL are both offered at the Khartoum American School here in, in Khartoum. <laughs> um, and they're offered three times a year, and it's a paper-based test. Um, and so if you're interested in business, you can find a program that takes the GRE, and then you don't have to necessarily deal with it that issue. Um, but the general license, there was an amendment to, to this general license that was released in April of 2013 that came out just this year. Um, and 
that it is possible if a U.S. company chooses to offer the GMAT now in Sudan. It's also possible for a U.S. company to offer the U.S. MLEs, um, the CPA, the accounting certification exam, and other sort of professional exams because we created this general license. Now, that sort of depends on the U.S. company finding a partner here in Sudan to um, implement that project. But those things are possible now, and it's just a matter of making it happen. Um, so those are the exams. Um, anything else that you have to send? There is sort of one more major thing. Letters of recommendation. Exactly. Have, you, have any of you had to have letters of recommendation sent to your... Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Oh, so you applied for that, and you were, were you involved in that program? Yes, uh, last, uh, last year I was involved in it, I was in the last couple of November, so I did the Okay, great, that's cool. Um, the letter of recommendation is another sort of really strange and specific thing to the U.S. Um, admissions process. And um, I also manage some other programs where I have um, had the opportunity to read a lot of letters of recommendation. And the biggest piece of advice that I can give you is when you're asking your professors for letters of recommendation, make sure that you've developed a relationship with that professor. Make sure that professor understands why you've chosen the specific university that you've chosen um, and why you want to go to graduate school. And you can even help him by reminding him of some projects that you've done where you were really, really successful working with him. Um, and in that way, he's going to be able to write you a better letter of recommendation. A lot of the recommendations I've read from Sudan have a lot of praise, which is nice. Sometimes they're just merely um, a confirmation that you studied or worked someplace. Um, and if you want to have a really, really successful application to graduate school, you need your letters of recommendation to talk much more about your qualifications for graduate school. And I encourage you not to be afraid to ask your professors, especially if you try to develop relationships with them, to write letters of recommendation, because it's in their own personal interest and in the university's interest to write you a good letter of recommendation. If the University of Khartoum can say, we have 10 students studying at US universities this year, um, or we have 20 students, that makes the University of Khartoum look much stronger. And if U.S. universities start to recognize the University of Khartoum students as very high quality, then that helps the University of Khartoum start to develop its own international network of relationships with U.S. universities. And I, already, I know they already have other international relationships. So you shouldn't be afraid to ask for letters of recommendation. Um, so those are the things you actually have to send to the U.S. universities. Your, your transcripts, your, your test scores, the GRE and the TOEFL, your letters of recommendation, and your personal statements. And on the personal statement, you should be writing a different personal statement for each university you apply to. Um, don't just write one personal statement and send that same personal statement to all the universities. Make sure you've tailored your personal statement to the university. It's like a man wearing a really, really baggy suit, and then he gets the baggy suit tailored, and he looks much sharper. You want each one of your personal statements to be a man wearing a nice tailored suit. Okay, so now let's talk about financial aid. Um, and, and I'll go back to my point about how you apply directly to U.S. universities for admission. You also apply directly to U.S. universities for scholarships. So the gentleman here had a lot of advice about sort of how to set yourself up to succeed in getting scholarships. And so now we'll talk to you about where those scholarships come from and in what form those scholarships take. Um, in the U.S., the money comes directly from the U.S. university. So while you are applying to the university, sometimes you're also, that same application for admission is going to be considered for um, is going to be used to consider whether or not you get financial aid. Um, in other cases, you have to provide extra material, extra justifications, tell more stories um, in order to in order to apply for certain fellowships that are offered by the university. 
but your main point of contact for application is the university. It's not the U.S. government. It's not outside organizations. There are some opportunities available from outside organizations in the U.S. government, but 95% of all of the money that you are going to apply for to study in the U.S. is going to be is going to come from the university. The university will decide. And if you forget everything that you learned today at this at this seminar, please just remember that one thing. Um, so, how do U.S. universities give out money? Um, the money takes the form of assistantships, just like here at the University of Khartoum, there are teaching assistantships and research assistantships. So you work in the university for maybe 20 hours a week, and then the university says, okay, we're going to cancel either part or all of your tuition, or all of the resum of Gracia. And those, that tuition is the most expensive part of your study in the U.S. So U.S. study can cost anywhere between $20,000 and $40,000 a year. So if you have to work 20 hours a week to have a $40,000 year tuition payment canceled, I think it's definitely worth it. The other good thing about these assistantship positions is that they, um, they give you teaching experience, which is going to be useful in your professional development. Um, so they're definitely worth trying to go after. Universities also give out money in the form of fellowships. Um, and oftentimes those fellowships are um, at a certain amount of money that maybe a former alum decided to donate to the university for a certain cause. And some universities like Purdue, I know Purdue's business school in Illinois, they have nine scholarships or nine fellowships set aside every year to attract students from Africa. Okay? So the challenge is, doing all this research to find universities that are offering fellowships or that are, that are trying to attract a more diverse student body. And that's where you all are going to be very competitive. So if you can find a fellowship that is for um, somebody from the African continent who wants to focus in math. Um, oftentimes there are lots of fellowships available um, that are meant to, to attract more women to, to certain fields, in, and especially in the sciences, technology, engineering, and math. So there are all kinds of different fellowships, and so you just have to do your research to find the universities that are offering these different sorts of opportunities. Um, so, so that's fellowships. And then the other, um, the other way that universities offer financial aid is based on need. So many universities are going to ask you to send your family's financial information, and then they'll say, okay, you know, Aya has $10,000 to spend every year on her education. We cost $20,000 a year. Aya is a really exceptional student. We're going to try to give her $10,000 a year to fill that gap between what she can pay and what, and what financial resources we have available so that we can make this opportunity possible for her. So that's, those are the, basically the three main ways to get financial aid, through assistantships, fellowships, and need-based financial aid. Sometimes the financial aid is also, merit is also considered. So merit would be the successes that you've had, how good of a student that you've been, um, because universities use financial aid as a tool to attract the best students to their programs. Um, and there are some fields that offer more aid, or that oftentimes attract more financial aid than others. Um, usually the sciences, technology, engineering, and math attracts more financial aid compared to the humanities or the social sciences. And then it becomes more difficult to find financial aid for public health,